Hey there, it's Teddy coming to you from down in my record room with yet another vinyl orgy. Uh, this time with a guest appearance from Miss Millie. Uh, Millie the Mutt has been bugging the hell out of me to get on camera and say hello to everyone. So, hey, I had to oblige because she is just that awesome. Anyway, I am continuing on with my Stop and Smell the Roses tour of my collection as the vinyl intake valve is shut down and will continue to be so for quite some time. But I have to be really honest that uh, it has been awesome. It has been therapeutic, very cathartic just to work amongst the collection as it stands. So on uh, this orgy, I will continue with uh, working my way around uh, different sections, different genres, and uh, will offer up uh, some, some great records that uh, each and every one of them are highly recommended. So let's get to it. Well, first up, I have a little something for uh, you adventure seekers out there. It's a 10-inch EP that was released in mid-November of this past year. And it's one of the last albums that uh, I picked up prior to shutting things down. And man, am I glad I did. Uh, it's from the Cuban-born pianist and composer David Varelis. It's called Antenna. And it's on the ECM label. <laughs> man, this couldn't be any more un-ECM-ish as possible. I mean, even down to the label does not feature their, uh, their usual uh, green and silver offering. But this is quite interesting, and it is rather forward-thinking. It's an electroacoustic affair that uh, uh, features a lot of uh, sonically textured um, nods to the past. Uh, you'll hear... Um, elements uh, of uh, field recordings and like a nod to the uh, None Such Explorer series. Uh, you'll definitely hear a nod to Miles Davis uh, in a silent way and a very early weather report. So it has that very um, atmospheric moodiness going on as well. Uh, you'll hear a tip of the cap to Brian Eno and, and Wendy Carlos. Uh, there's even uh, a Cuban rapper on one of the cuts, so it is quite varied and uh, quite dense. And uh, it's handled with uh, you know a variety of uh, musicians. Um, Varelis himself, of course, is a, a keyboardist who uses an arsenal of of stuff from you know acoustic piano, Hammond B3. Um, vintage electric pianos, prepared piano, uh, programming samples, etc. Uh, Alexander Overington is on uh, uh, electronics and cello. You've got a visit from uh, the great Henry Threadgill and uh, the drummer Marcus Gilmore. So the, it carries some gravitas with uh, folks that are on uh, this recording. There are a couple of uh, uh, Cuban vocalists and um, uh, percussionists. So yeah, it's just got uh, a nice uh, blend, uh, a nice uh, variety of stuff going on. And as I said, it is it is very, very dense. I mean, at times you almost feel it might collapse under its own weight, but it never does. It just stays in this really great pocket. Um, 22 minutes of uh, really neat stuff. Um, as I said, Varelis was born in Cuba. Uh, he's been here in the United States for, oh, the past seven or eight years. Uh, he has other recordings under his name that are you know, more of a traditional uh, post-bop modernist uh, type, um, you know, with people like Andrew Surreal on drums, uh, if that gives you a point of reference. But this is something wholly different. 
Um, and I'm going to be very curious what his next move is, if this is just a one-off or if it's a jumping off place. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm very pleased that labels like ECM are beginning to uh, see the light and, and put some things out, both new and reissue on vinyl. Uh, there are a lot of other interesting artists that are living in the jazz vein that uh, are with labels that uh, up to this point have just been CD only. Um, but there's uh, winds of change there too, where uh, like Pi Recordings is beginning to uh, put some things out on vinyl. And I hope they find it uh, worthwhile and profitable so that uh, people like you and me can... Uh, can benefit and so anyway i really urge you to check this out it's very cool um david varellis uh, antenna on the ecm label from 2016. <laughs> For my money, just about the best American band over the last 30 plus years. And I'm talking about Los Lobos, uh, the band from East Los Angeles, California. And this is their 1992 masterpiece, Kiko. Uh, this is a 2014 uh, reissue on Mobile Fidelity. They did get their hands on the original master tape, so it's just a brilliant quality job uh, done by those guys but Los Lobos um, uh, I put in the same league as the band in terms of uh, their knowledge and and uh, experience with uh, diverse musical styles um, and uh, you know they take all of this and kind of run it through their own uh, rootsy blender uh, they got together some of the, the, the key guys, uh, David Hidalgo and uh, Louis Perez, met in high school. Uh, they've been at it, as I said, for you know decades and got their start uh, playing parties and weddings. So yeah, they had to work through quite a variety of material and gained uh, immense experience performing live. And to this day, they are so uh, professional and and just great live shows. Uh, if you have a chance to see them, uh, I wouldn't hesitate. Uh, they're fantastic in that regard. Uh, they kind of kicked off their uh, recording career in earnest in 1982, and, uh, and 10 years later, uh, they were seeking something uh, different, something sonically interesting in the studio. And they worked with uh, the great producer Mitchell Froome and uh, engineer Chad Blake. And they came up with a very ethereal at times, very uh, uh, atmospheric, uh, layered effort that uh, just hit the mark from beginning to end. And uh, it really straddles this perfect line between um, rootsy and artsy. It's, uh, yeah, it's a masterpiece for sure. And uh, so uh, happy that Mobile Fidelity uh, really went in and did a, a beautiful number and, uh, and put this out on vinyl as it should have been all along. Uh, so I urge you to uh, uh, check this out. Yes, it will cost a, a few more dollars, um, but it is... Uh, worth every penny it has legs it does not sound dated whatsoever again it's kiko by los lobos originally released in 1992 and reissued on vinyl in 2014 by mobile fidelity <sighs> masterpiece indeed <laughs> For many, 
Otis Spann is considered to be the greatest blues pianist of the post-World War II era. And actually, uh, you'll get no argument here. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Otis Spann chaired the piano uh, in Muddy Waters' great band. And uh, he was given a chance in 1960 uh, to record uh, his first album as a leader on the Candid label. Uh, and this is actually Candid's first release as well. It's called Otis Spann is the Blues, and uh, it's a duet uh, with the great guitarist and vocalist Robert Lockwood Jr., who uh, was Robert Johnson's stepson. Now, that's, that's not a myth. Uh, it, it, it's real, and, uh, you know, according to Lockwood, that, uh, you know, he... As a youngster, uh, learned a few uh, tricks from Johnson on the guitar. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth between um, Otis Spann uh, singing and uh, Lockwood Jr. singing. Um, what I really love uh, about Otis Spann in general is that uh, he's a much more laid, he has a, a, a laid back approach. Uh, to piano playing, uh, it's it's more heady and and his uh, notes seem to be more uh, thought out. Now, when called upon, uh, he could pound out some in incredibly serious boogie woogie, uh, as he was you know equally uh, powerful with his left hand as his right, and so he could do anything that he chose really. But but he stayed in this. This more laid-back pocket, and and the same with his vocals. Uh, very underrated vocalists. I'm really drawn to them. They're they're very dusky and syrupy and uh, and uh, elastic in that way. And I'm 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 just very in, intrigued by that as well. Um, one of the uh, interesting things. Um, on the uh, the back and the the liner notes of course they are uh, written by uh, the great Nat Hentoff who passed away recently the the jazz critic author and essayist and and he was uh, involved with uh, the candid label as uh, as an A&R guy supervisor slash producer so uh, you know right off the bat they just you know really nailed one um, on the uh, the liner notes, uh, there's a quote from Otis Spann that's really intriguing, and I think it sums up um, a lot about the blues and, and even various eras. It says here, quote, Most of the people who come to hear us uh, work hard during the day. The blues for them is something like a book. They want to hear stories out of their own experiences and that's the kind we tell. Man, that, that's just awesome. Um, this, uh, for 1960, the recording is impeccable. And it holds up just perfect uh, today. Just, just so well done. So, anyway, uh, Otis Span, Any Otis Span, Just go get some Otis Span. But uh, this one I'd kind of put at the top of the list. Uh, from 1960, Otis Spann is the blues on the Candid label. Yeah, man. <laughs> Well, I've had this record since it was released in 1980, and it was a recommend uh, from my late friend and classical music mentor David Kahn and when David recommended something you listened um, David's particular forte was 20th century classical and uh, boy he he really knew his stuff and he recommended this um, for me at the time as I was just beginning to learn about 20th century classical because of its approachability as uh, David explained to me um, that uh, in the 1920s and the 1960s, uh, you'd find more uh, experimental 
uh, stuff going on. And in between, there was there was more of a lyrical approachability, and uh, the pieces on this album uh, fit in that pocket. Um, this is called uh, American Music for Strings, um, and it is recorded with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra and conducted by Gerard Schwartz, who really uh, had uh, a, a feeling and an affinity for that particular uh, lyrical, approachable pocket of uh, American 20th century work. Uh, four great, four, four great uh, composers here with Samuel Barber, Irving Fine, um, Elliot Carter, and David Diamond. And I want to particularly focus on the David Diamond piece called Rounds for String Orchestra. Um, it is just wonderful. Um, the backstory with that, it was, um, it was written in 1944, so in the middle of World War II, and uh, the great conductor, Dimitri Metropolis, um, was telling Diamond that uh, you know, a lot of the newer material that he was conducting um, it was very uh, uh, dark, uh, had a lot of melancholy. And of course, you know, the world is wrapped up in a, in a world war, and, and that seems to be a natural um, output from that. But he, he asked David Diamond, uh, you know, write me something happy. I mean, just as simple as that. And so uh, uh, Rounds for String Orchestra uh, has three movements. Uh, the first and third movement uh, are very joyous, happy, uh, very cool. The, oh, the, the middle uh, movement is just some of the most um, hauntingly uh, beautiful uh, melancholia. Oh, I mean, I just about uh, cry every time that I hear this middle part, uh, middle movement, and then it comes back to uh, some uh, upbeat stuff. But it is uh, one of the most recorded pieces of uh, the great David Diamond. Uh, but uh, once the 60s hit, uh, you know, he, he kind of uh, went under the covers again in terms of popularity. And uh, I think he played out a lot of his days um, uh, teaching at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. But uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff, as I said, lyrical and approachable. And if you're thinking about um, exploring 20th century classical music, uh, this is a, a really, really good place to start. Um, American Music for Strings on uh, the Nunsuch label uh, from 1980. Very cool. Well, what I have here is an amazing document of one of the greatest live performers of all time, uh, a person who left every ounce of themselves on stage during every performance, and that's no exaggeration. I'm speaking of the late, great Otis Redding, and uh, this is uh, a 1968 release on ATCO called Otis Redding in person at the Whiskey A Go Go. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. Um, if Otis Redding uh, cannot uh, raise your heart rate to any degree, then uh, <laughs> I mean, you might as well be uh, hanging out in a morgue with a uh, with an ID tag uh, tied around your big toe because this guy could bring it at all times. Um, this was actually recorded in 1966, and um, it was part of a two-pronged effort that Atlantic had to uh, try to introduce Otis Redding to a white audience. Um, first off, they, they, they brought him to the Whiskey A Go-Go uh, with his uh, touring band. So, you know, in a sense, they were just, you know, inserting uh, the southern uh, chitlin circuit 
directly uh, into the Sunset Strip of Los Angeles. And the second part was to try to get a live recording that would also serve to uh, introduce uh, Redding to a wide audience. So uh, what ensued was uh, an incredible misjudgment from uh, the folks at Atlantic. They heard the tapes and uh, they deemed it uh, too raw to release. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going, too raw? I mean, Otis Redding was the epitome of raw. Raw power, uh, raw emotion. I mean, the dude was raw. And that's what was so beautiful and amazing about him. Well, they uh, eventually got uh, the breakthrough that they were hoping for um, in 1967 when he appeared at the Monterey Pop Festival. And uh, it really took off after that. And then uh, uh, just a few months later, uh, he was sadly um, snuffed out uh, in a, uh, a plane crash. And so as... Uh, uh, record companies have a tendency to do uh, when someone uh, leaves us suddenly and tragically. Uh, they, they definitely glom on to it and uh, pull everything they can off the shelves. And they, they uh, pulled this off the shelf and released it. And uh, uh, for better or worse, whatever the rationale was, I'm glad that they did. Because uh, this is so cool to hear um, the... Uh, the, the touring band. I mean, he is on other records with uh, the members of Booker T and the MGs, and they're awesome. Don't get me wrong, but there is just something really, really cool about uh, the uh, folks that he's playing with here. So anyway, Otis Redding, man, just uh, <laughs> he was the king. I mean, you know, James Brown, is awesome as hell. Um, if I had to, uh, if I had a gun held to my head and I had to pick one, I'll take Otis Redding. Um, yeah, I just will. And I hope you will too, at least this album. Um, Otis Redding, in person at the Whiskey A Go Go, uh, recorded in 1966, but not released until 1968 on Echo Records. Well, speaking of passionate music, uh, how about a little tango? I offer up uh, Astor Piazzolla and his 1988 release, The Rough Dancer and the Cyclical Night, on the American Clave uh, label. Uh, boy, you know, if you're talking about uh, the great Argentinian export known as tango, look no further than Astor Piazzolla. I mean, he is like, sort of like the Duke Ellington mixed with Jimi Hendrix and Muhammad Ali, uh, all wrapped up into one, you know, within the world of tango. I mean, he created this uh, just sophisticated and sensual concoction uh, where he uh, combined elements of uh, classical and jazz and uh, fused them into old world tango and the results are just amazing um, you know he uh, yeah this this music is it, it, there's a there's a really rich dark nostalgia and sensuality to this music that uh, it is hard to find elsewhere um, and, oh yeah, it's so attractive. And he could also, um, kind of work around the edges of, uh, the avant-garde as well. I mean, he did things, um, similar to Charles Mingus, where he would, uh, he would stop and start, uh, on a dime, change tempos to change the mood and, uh, uh, you know, very effective in terms of, you know, retaining uh, interest, you know, in particular compositions. It's, it's 
wonderfully skilled in that way. Um, I said this was released in 1988, and it was on the heels of a real breakthrough album in 1986 on the same label, American Clave. It was called uh, Tango Zero Hour. Uh, both of them were uh, produced by uh, the great uh, uh, producer, empresario, uh, Kip Hanrahan. Uh, John Kiefer, hey John, um, he showed uh, Tango Zero Hour on uh, one of the Dr. Rhythm uh, sessions, which are <laughs> always fantastic. But he, uh, he talked a little bit about that as well. So if you're considering uh, adding uh, a little world music, a little tango into your collection, um, tango-wise, uh, this, uh, The Rough Dancer in the Cyclical Night and Tango Zero Hour, those would be the two. Um, they're both kind of... Uh, uh, kind of a match set, if you will. You know, they uh, they they're just great, and and both are, uh, yeah, top shelf stuff. So, anyway, Astor Piazzolla, the Rough Dancer and the Cyclical Night uh, from 1988 on the American Clave label. Um, if you look here on the cover, these dancers, uh, this guy is, uh, he has his tongue out and it is approaching her armpit. So that is getting somewhere, my friends. He was a friend of mine. When I hear his name. Well, sometimes uh, I'm a little slow figuring these things out, but. Uh, it just dawned on me as I'm making my way uh, through these albums that there is a theme to this video, and it's uh, centered around uh, passionate uh, artists, passionate performers, and Dave Van Ronk fits that bill beautifully. Uh, this is a 1972 uh, double album comp on uh, the fantasy label just called Dave Van Ronk. And it's a comp of sorts. What it really is, is uh, it combines uh, two previously uh, released albums on uh, Prestige. Uh, the first one uh, was a 1962 release classic record uh, called Folk Singer. And the second one was uh, a follow-up in 1963 called Inside Dave Van Ronk. Um, so they just put them together in a new package but the really cool thing is that uh, they both albums were originally recorded by Rudy Van Gelder and uh, they got Rudy Van Gelder in 1972 to remaster both albums and uh, for this particular release I mean there is the Van Gelder stamp and the dead wax here so it it sounds great, and it's an upgrade from uh, sonically uh, from the original releases. So very cool to have this as well. I mean, I've never been scared of a comp anyway. Um, uh, you know, coming up when I was learning about uh, music and, and artists, comps were just a magnificent way to, you know, to hear their music uh, quickly and and uh, to get a grasp of uh, what they were all about. Now, what Dave Van Ronk was all about was uh, interpreting traditional musics. Uh, now, whether that be uh, country, blues, uh, ragtime, swing, New Orleans jazz, um, old English songs, if it was old and it was traditional, Dave Van Ronk liked to take it and then uh, kick it back out in his uh, individual style uh, with wonderful acoustic guitar playing and this incredible uh, nicotine and whiskey soaked voice that he would uh, whisper and howl. It was just a wonderful uh, blend uh, that uh, his performances both recorded and live. Um, so he was uh, also known affectionately as the mayor of McDougal Street. So in the early 60s in Greenwich Village, uh, New York, 
Uh, he was the cock of the walk. Uh, Bob Dylan has uh, spoken and written about Van Ronk and uh, how revered he was and how much he holds him uh, dear even to this day. Um, the difference really between Dave Van Ronk and Bob Dylan is that, as I said, he interpreted traditional materials. So he didn't write much uh, of it on his own. And, and of course, you know, Dylan, Nobel laureate, um, wrote and wrote and wrote his own materials. So big difference there. But for a period of time, yeah, this was the man of Greenwich Village. As a matter of fact, those of you out there, um, and I'm thinking of a few, um, Fred, uh, Big Star 1000, hey Fred, those of you that like uh, to read uh, music history books uh, or uh, music biographies, I highly recommend uh, this one, and it is called Dave Van Ronk, The Mayor of McDougal Street, a memoir. Uh, Van Ronk, uh, was starting it, uh, and uh, he passed away, and uh, Elijah Wald took it from there. It is a fascinating, fascinating read about uh, New York and Greenwich Village, the folk scene, and Van Ronk himself. What a character. I mean, this is really a highly, highly recommended book, so I would check that out as well. But yeah, um, yeah, folk interpreted uh, interpreted traditional music at its finest. Uh, Dave Van Ronk from 1972 on uh, the Fantasy labels. <laughs> One last thing, I'm in high school uh, in 1973. I can clearly remember sitting in uh, an art class, and we were allowed to have a radio, and uh, the song "Cocaine Blues." Uh, came up because we, you know, were of the age of kind of the underground FM radio. And yeah, can you imagine that not too long ago, a song, a traditional song about cocaine uh, with uh, Dave Van Ronk uh, spilling it out was actually on the radio. Crazy. Anyway, check it out. Get it. Sample it. Love it. Put it in your collection. You won't regret it. So I want to end on one of my all-time artistic heroes and one of the coolest, hippest people to ever walk the face of the earth. And that's Lester Young. As a matter of fact, Lester Young is the only musician that uh, I have a picture of in my home. Uh, he is that important to me. Uh, this is uh, a 1975 uh, comp on Blue Note uh, called the Aladdin Sessions. It's a double uh, LP that was uh, part of this great comp reissue series that uh, uh, Blue Note did in the, in the 70s. Um, but for me, uh, Lester Young, um, all modern jazz roads lead back to Lester Young. He influenced so many people uh, from Charlie Parker on. Um, if you take uh, improvisation as the core of jazz, he was one of the greatest improvisers ever of the genre. I mean, he was a endless supply of uh, creative thought when it came to improvising. Uh, he uh, first came on the scene nationally uh, with the Count Basie Orchestra when they were discovered uh, by John Hammond in 1936. And at that time, he had uh, a lighter tone uh, and was more rhythmically fluid than the uh, the other tenor man of the day, Coleman Hawkins. Um, by all accounts, uh, Lester Young was an extremely sensitive man, and uh, he was drafted 
into World War II, and uh, he just didn't want to have any part of it. He, uh, he wouldn't comply. Um, he was uh, busted for pot, and he was thrown in uh, military jail for uh, around a year's time. And uh, when he came out, um, uh, a, a label uh, in Los Angeles called Laden Records uh, started uh, recording him. And uh, they are just uh, fantastic. This, uh, this comp uh, does it in the order that they were uh, recorded. And when he came out... Um, there was a noticeably uh, darker tone to uh, his saxophone, and uh, I can imagine. I mean, he, um, you know, he came out of that hellhole, and uh, the racial injustice uh, that came with it, and came with the military, uh, with a, a different attitude, and um, it it was reflected. Uh, in his tone, where before he played lighter, now it's a little darker. Um, on these recordings, there is just uh, a wealth of, uh, uh, of mood, emotion, tempo. He is the master, one of the masters of the ballad. And uh, there's a version of these foolish things on here that is so achingly beautiful and every line that he blows in this song is like a short story unto itself it's just amazing what he is able to do there are a number of um, lester young aficionados that uh, don't particularly care for his post world war ii period um, Part of, uh, you know, part of his M.O., modus operandi, was uh, to drink. And uh, uh, he drank to ease the pain uh, from uh, all that he had been through. And it did affect his playing. But, you know, deep inside of an artist, the art is still there. It just finds a different way out. And, uh, yep, he his... Uh, his tone darkened, his playing slowed down, but his notes became more measured, and uh, the the art was still loud and clear to my ears. So I don't buy uh, the idea that um, that time is is lesser than an earlier time. Um, when I hear him towards the end of his life, when he passed away in 1959. I hear the sum total of a man's life experiences, uh, not an artist drinking himself to death. So, there's lots of Lester Young out there, and um, and and there is there are shadings as as he moves along through his uh, discography. But for me, it's all great, and uh, he is just uh, a master of masters. <sighs> yeah, Lester Young. Man, Lester, I hope I did you okay, buddy. 1975 release, The Aladdin Sessions on Blue Note Records. Well, that wraps up uh, this vinyl orgy. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate all of your comments. Um, and I do like having uh, dialogues with people. Uh, you comment, I guarantee you, I do respond. If you've taken the effort and the time uh, to watch this video or any video and you comment, you deserve a response. So that is my promise to you. And uh, I would like you to promise me something that you will do what you can to keep it in the groove and I'll see you next time.